Hello everyone, we are doing module 4 on snoop based multiprocessor design. This is lecture 3 which is the continuation of lecture 2 on single level caches with an atomic bus. In the previous lecture we have seen the requirements we need to add to a uniprocessor cache to make it multiprocessor cache coherent friendly. In this we are going to look at the organization that is the actual design uh, placement and other things and the correctness aspects. Okay, so, we will immediately start with the organization. So, I will give you a big picture here on this slide and a detailed design will be given on the next slide as a ready answer. Okay, so, we will uh, do it slowly and uh, you can pause the video in the middle, try to connect all the components of which, which I am drawing here with the previous lecture. Okay, so, base organization first thing is we have a cache which is the uniprocessor cache which is connected to the processor, ok. So, cache is connected to the processor. Then uh, we discussed that we have two tag arrays. All the things which we discussed are going to be now placed into a design, ok. So, we have duplicated the tag arrays and this tag array I will say is for the processor and the second tag array is for the bus, ok. Then we have the FSM for the the processor side FSM. Then this processor side FSM manages this side. Then I have the snooping or the bus side FSM. So we have the bus side controller which will look at this side. It is going to access that tag and the other things. Okay. Now when a request comes from the processor it will compare the tag and then it has to send the request onto the bus. So, we need a bus, I will draw a bus at the bottom and the request from the processor will come. So, this FSM is going to send the command that is whether the processor wants to read or write the data item and then it will put this on the bus. And when it puts this, it also has to put the address. So, the address will come from the tag array and the original address. So, it will combine and put the address onto the bus, ok. So, this is how the processor interaction happens. So, when you put the address and the command onto the bus, you are going to get an answer. Suppose you are reading the block, so memory which is connected somewhere here will give the data, ok. So, now that data comes and you have to store the data. So, the data comes and sits here into this data buffer. So, this is coming like this and once you get the data, you directly send it to the cache, ok. So, this is the interaction by the processor. Now, what happens on the bus side? Now, the bus side controller is uh, essentially the snooping controller. Now, the snooping controller has to keep on checking what happens onto the bus and every time some address or the command is coming, it has to keep track. So, any command which is coming from outside any address which is coming from outside that is going a bus read x or a bus read which is going onto the bus, they both come, we store them here, ok. And then these two will be now used for comparison because do we have the data or not, we have to check. So, these two go here. So, I am drawing an abstract picture, ok. So, the, these two will come here, this tag which is a copy for the bus side controller. So, this will be compared. Now, along with this, if you recollect, we had a write buffer and this write buffer was storing the write back blocks from the cache which will eventually be sent onto the bus for the memory, ok. So, whenever we write back data, it is put into the write back buffer which is then connected to the memory. So, this buffer has multiple probably multiple blocks and we also need to compare that, ok. So, all these 1, 2 and this 3 and 4 all these are used for comparison. So, we are going to compare all of this and then decide to give the snooping result. So, the snoop answer is coming from the comparator and then put onto the bus, ok. So, this is the overall picture of the organization. So, the red part uh, except the bus controller. So, the red part is what was existing in a uniprocessor design whereas, the blue, green and the bus side controller is what we have added, ok. 
So this uh, is a neater picture of the same thing. Okay. And here we list all the components in case you want a ready reference. You can keep uh, checking this with the previous slide. We have a write back cache, we have dual tags, then a processor side controller which checks the address and command, a write back transaction which goes via the write buffer, then the read transaction goes via the data buffer. We have controller on the bus side which compares the tags then bus arbitration. So definitely I did not draw this, but there is a bus FSM which will arbitrate for the bus. If it gets the grant, it will do the required transactions and so on. Finally, the snoop results uh, which will come from the comparator will be put onto the bus. So these uh, snoop results will act as an acknowledgement to the initiator. So when we put snoop results onto the bus, so this, when we put this onto the bus, uh, you all understand that this answer of the snoop will help decide whether memory gives the data, cache gives the data and how should the requester behave. Okay. Okay. So it also helps in my proof because when an act comes we can say that we have seen this request that is uh, whichever cache was supposed to take action would have taken appropriate action as part of the snoop results. So, this is the organization and then for this organization we are going to look at these uh, various correctness requirements which uh, we will do them one by one. Okay. So, before we go to the correctness requirements one small thing we need to take care that happens because of this that is the bus arbitration and putting the request onto the bus is not happening instantaneously but there are several small steps which are involved. Right, so we uh, when we draw the protocol FSM, we say that this is one state, we put an arrow and then we go to the next state. So if there is a bus read, from bus read we immediately go from an invalid state to a shared state or the state E. Okay. So if I say this is I, I can immediately go to S. Okay, so we just draw this as the theoretical protocol, but you are not sure that when you send the request onto the bus whether you got the bus or not and definitely there are many intermediate actions which are to be done. Okay. So one is that you send a request onto the bus, then the other snoop controllers are going to do a cache lookup, then it is your local controller you are going to do arbitration, you may get the bus, you may not get the bus. Even if you get the bus, when you send a request to the next cache, it has to do its own lookup, take uh, appropriate actions. That is, each cache controller will have to take uh, appropriate actions and then finally respond with their answer. So, this is going to take time. Okay? So, other cache controllers will uh, work, then they will put the answer onto the bus accordingly. The sender will decide and finally, the block will be written or read by the requester. Okay. So, when you are doing several of these actions definitely lot of race conditions are going to take place. Okay. Now, we will see an example that suppose I request a block B okay, uh, and then a request for a block B is coming to me but even I want to change the state of block B. So, this processor P1 it is working it is doing some work with B in the meanwhile P2 says I want to work on B. Okay, so, there is a race between P1 and P2. So, we will look at that example. Okay, so, we have processor P1, P2 and both of them have the block A and now P1 says I want to write to A. So, it will send a bus upgrade. This is a variant of the messy where uh, instead of bus read X, we send a bus upgrade if we already have the block. So, this is the state of the block in both the processors. This one also sends a bus upgrade. Now, both of them are sending a request to the bus, but only one of them will get. Okay? So, now you can realize that I cannot directly go from here to here just in a single step. So, P1 uh, and P2 both contend for the bus, but P2 gets the bus here. So, P2 succeeds and P2 moves to state M. When P2 moves to state M, P1 has to go to state I it has to invalidate and remember this is still pending. I mean uh, we can say that this was a pending work it had to do, but now it has to relinquish the block and subsequently again retry. Right? So, this pending work had to be 
retried in step number 3 and in step 3 eventually it will be able to complete. Okay. So, now this has to be handled by our controllers. Okay. So, the same uh, thing is written on this slide. Okay. Moving on. So, for handling such race conditions, we need to do some changes to the finite state machine. So, for ready reference, I have copied the messy FSM onto this slide. We have seen this in detail in the previous module. Now, this is the FSM and I want to adapt all these race conditions or be able to handle those race conditions. So, I am going to do some changes to this. Right, so, we can go back and forth for the time being, we will directly start adding the states. Okay. So, I have just uh, noted them here and we will try to add new states to handle those race conditions. Okay. So, we have state i, the block is not present. And when the block is not present, we can either get a bus uh, read or a bus write request. So, when we get a bus read request, bus read request, what did we do? We went from i to s. Okay. We went from i to s and on a bus write, we went from i to m. And depending on the shared wired or we could also go to e. Okay. So, let us look at uh, i to s or i to e transition. So, from i, if you get a processor read, we normally send a bus read and directly go to s or e. Okay, But now, uh, if you look at the race condition example, you may or may not get the bus. Okay, So, just demanding bus is not getting the bus. So, I have to first request for the bus. So, I am going to now have two small things split into this. Our uh, you sorry, once you get a processor read, you send a bus request. Then you may or may not get the bus. Okay. So, when you do this, you have to go to some state. So, from this square uh, state, if we get a bus grant, we will send the bus read signal because it is a read request and then check for the S or S bar. And depending on that, we will either go to state S or we will go to state E. Okay. So, now, I am not directly going from i to s or e, I am going from i to the square state and from the square that is this box, I am going to e or s. So, this state, I am going to rename this or give some name to this. This state says that I am going from i to either s or e. You can give any name, but we are trying to be as close to the implementation. So, we are saying from i, I am either going to s or e. So, I am going to name this square box as uh, this particular notation. Okay, let us do the write part, processor write. When a processor write comes, we send a bus read x, but now we can't directly do that. First, we have to request. So, let us send a bus request. So, when you send a bus request, again, I am going to another new state. From here, you will get a grant or you may not get a grant. If you get a grant, you go to bus to the state m. So, bus grant send a bus read x and then go to m. Okay. If you do not get a grant, then you will keep waiting there for the grant to come. Okay. So, these are two states. What should I call this? This is on the way from i to m. So, I can simply say i arrow m for this box. Okay. There is uh, one more variation that says if I am in state s, I will use another color for this. If I am in state S and we get processor write request, because from state E, if you get a processor write, you directly go to M because there is nothing uh, other sharer in the system to be informed. But in S, you have to inform others. So, when we are here, we again need to send a bus read X. But I cannot do that now. I have to first send a bus request. So, when I send a bus request, I need a square box. Okay, so, we will go to a square box from here and then if you get a grant, you will go to M. Okay. Once you get a bus grant, we will send a bus read X and then go to M. But if we do not get a bus grant, okay, let me call this state as S arrow M. Okay. When I am standing in S arrow M, this square box, in the meanwhile, here because the block is shared, it is possible that some other uh, cache requests this block. Okay. So, from somewhere else. So, from elsewhere, you get a 
some request for the same block okay that request comes and now if it is a bus read x what does this request mean which is coming from outside it says that somebody wants to write to the block so we have to remove this block and where are we right now standing here okay so because of this green request which comes we would have to go out of this box and invalidate the block okay so now the block will get removed whereas we were assuming that we are in this uh, intermediate state waiting for the bus grant so while we are waiting for the grant our block was removed and next time when you retry your retry cannot begin from here because this state represents that you already have the block okay so you cannot retry from here but you have to retry from a state which is remembering what you are going to do i can either go to i or i can go to a more useful state which is this so what i'll do i'll go to a more useful state which is this because now once i see a bus read x which is the green transaction coming i have to invalidate the block probably also give the block if it is cash to cash sharing and then go and stand in this red rectangle i to m okay and once uh, we go there we know that we don't have the block and we are probably going to eventually move to m okay so this is how we have added these new states to the messy protocol okay even here this one instead of bus read x because we already had the block you could have sent a bus upgrade okay so you can also send a bus upgrade here okay so these are the intermediate states also called as transient states so apart from the cash uh, organization we have also added few functionalities to the messy protocol okay so again a neater diagram is given here the changes we have done is we have added three states one two and three three transient states have been added which are shown dotted in that uh, figure all right so this slide is uh, showing the complete picture integration of the messy as well as the transient states previous slide only highlighted the changes whereas here it's a complete picture so you can uh, cross refer to the pure messy only pr protocol that is messy states only and these three new added states one two and three so i'd shown them as rectangles in my explanation but they are shown here uh, with these highlights now these uh, transient states need to be called something so we call them transient or intermediate states and the other as stable states okay so we have two names stable states that is the original m e s i 1 2 3 4 these are stable and then the three new which we have added as transient you all understand it's going to add complexity to your system and uh, this problem would uh, come if I am using bus upgrade. So, if I am using bus upgrade, let me go back to this one. Okay. So, I said that here when we did the design, we said if you get a grant, you can either send a bus read x or a bus upgrade. But when you send a bus upgrade, it creates uh, more issues because you assume that you had the block. But in the meanwhile, if somebody takes away your block, then the bus upgrade which you are taking the action which you are taking gets translated to a bus read x when you have to flush the block uh, in the middle okay so when you are moving from s to m if some other cache wants the same block you invalidate your block and when you invalidate your block you can no longer send the bus upgrade but you have to send the bus read x instead of bus upgrade so your fsm has to take care of this it has more complexity that initially it was supposed to send bus upgrade but now suddenly it has to change its decision and send a bus read x so this adds more complexity and therefore some implementations say i will never use bus upgrade let me always be consistent and use a bus read x okay so yes so i'm not going to use bus upgrade but only bus read x because I do not want to change the decision of whether to send this or to send this depending on which intermediate state we are standing. All right, so this is how uh, the non atomicity that is the bus having several other steps before we get the grant is handled by the protocol by adding more intermediate transient states. 
so we have seen how to add transient states to the messy uh, FSM to handle the non-atomicity. And next with this base organization and all the additions which we have done, we have to check whether all our correctness requirements are satisfied. So what were the correctness requirements? They were cache coherence correctness that is right serialization, right completeness, right atomicity and then deadlock, live lock and starvation freedom. Okay? So we are going to see whether all these properties are satisfied by our designs. We have made the design and now we will check whether it satisfies them. Okay. Okay, so we are going to quickly do a recap of how bus orders, reads and writes. So these are the four processors, color codes say uh, the request coming from the particular uh, processor. So three are already ordered by the bus. Next P3 sends a write. Uh, so this is going to invalidate that block across all. And then P3 does some reads and writes. So they are drawn little above because they are local hits. Okay, so here. This will invalidate whether these are right hits within P3. So they will not go onto the bus, but uh, subsequent reads writes will go onto the bus by another processor. Okay. So these are uh, following the program order and a read by P2 will now go onto the bus and this is going to get the value written by this one. Okay. So this is how the bus is going to order the reads and writes. Okay, so for write serialization, that is the writes get serialized in my current design where I have a single level cache atomic bus. So there may be conflicts that is race conditions or there may be no race conditions. So if there is no race condition, what happens? So we have processor P1, it wants to do a write x equal to 2, it wants to do this. And presently the state of the block is S. It has the block in shared state, maybe there are other processors sharing it, P1 wants to write. But what it would do? You would say that why not write, but we have to uh, go to the M state for writing, Re presently we are in the S state. So for doing that, the protocol tells us first send a bus read x or an upgrade onto the bus. Okay, so first we are going to send this and when you send this, all the other processors will snoop. When they snoop the bus, they will be seeing that uh, write to x has happened. Okay? So write to x is seen by everybody because of the snooping controllers of P2, P3 and P4. So once they have seen this, the snoop results will come onto the bus. right? So the snoop results will come and once the snoop results come, P1 will know that yes, everybody knows about x being changed, it will go to the state m and then actually it will perform the write. Okay, so x will become 2 only after it moves from s to m. So that this is when there were no conflicts in the system. Okay, but now if there is some competition happening, right? there is a race condition. Look here, P1 also has the block x and P4 also has the block or wants the block. Okay, both of them are going to race with each other. P1 has in state S and P4 does not have it but wishes to write to it. Okay. Now P1 says I want to write to this block. So first thing it tries to send the bus request. Okay. At the same time P4 also sends the bus request. Both of them send the request at the same time but P4 gets the grant. Because P4 gets the grant, it will send the bus read x and the bus upgrade and this will result into, what will this result into? It will invalidate the block in P1. Okay? So P1 has to remove the block and then go to state i instead of s. And once this finishes, P4 will move from i to m. So in this uh, slide, we have seen a race condition where both P1 and P4 wanted to write and P4 gets the bus. So P1 has to relinquish its block and this is how the protocol will manage that exactly one of them gets the chance to go onto the bus and we know that the bus is going to serialize the writes. Okay? So how do we establish that serialization is taking place? So processor and cache must have a handshake which preserves the program order. right? So processor and cache are going to manage that properly according to the program order and once they go to the bus, the bus transactions are going to serialize. So once it reaches the bus, bus will serialize all the reads and the writes. 
if we have the block in state s it is very tempting that we start writing because we have the block why not write it okay but we cannot start writing until we get ownership of the block now why why are we imposing this condition we are imposing this condition because if you recollect this race condition p1 had the block it could have written uh, directly the value of x but you never know that another processor might want the same block and that processor might get access so if p4 got the access it ended up writing x and if p1 also had modified x it will result into an inconsistent state of the system so p1 even if it has the block it is not permitted to change the value until it gets the bus transaction completed okay so the temptation of writing is not permitted before acquiring ownership okay because if you do this in case of conflicting transaction that is a race condition happens you will have an inconsistent system state okay so if other transaction comes and it completes your answer will be inconsistent so we don't permit this to happen and if we maintain uh, the proper order that first go on to the bus and then change we will be able to serialize all the accesses okay so we can say that right serialization is established by properly following the protocol going through all the intermediate states and not writing the block even if we have the block in hand earlier okay so everything which appears on the bus will get correctly uh, serialized by the bus because the protocol says that even if here if you see here because the bus read x happened on that block p1 had to remove its block even if it had the block right so the order was first x equal to 4 and then x equal to 2 so this is the serialized order of the writes in this example and it will be correctly established if we follow the protocol properly that was write serialization now write completeness is required for sequential consistency completeness says that whenever a write is happening everybody in the system should have seen the write right if p1 changes x to something it makes sure that everybody has seen x equal to 2 before it starts using that x or doing any other action so that is write completeness so write completes with respect to all the caches okay so now we will say that uh, how strict is this so if I change x equal to 2 here I have to tell everybody that I am changing x and this is a long process okay so should I wait for everybody to invalidate and tell me that they have removed it or can I do it little early okay so we are going to see a small optimization in this case we are saying that the cache need not wait until all the invalidations finish okay we don't wait for them to invalidate because maybe those caches are busy they will take some time to invalidate but we should have somehow guaranteed that they will invalidate the block okay so how can we guarantee this we are saying that I am using an atomic bus when the transaction goes on to the bus we are sure that every cache is going to follow it properly and invalidate so they are going to listen to us that is the underlying assumption so in this way we guarantee that they have seen the right okay although they haven't invalidated but because they came to know that a bus read x has happened they will sincerely delete the block from their cache without doing any further changes to that block hence we can say they have seen the right so once they seen the right we can start updating okay so our base design what does it do it puts a transaction onto the bus and once it puts an invalidation transaction that is a bus read x the bus read x will eventually go to others invalidate get an acknowledgement and so on so we need not wait so once we get a bus grant and we send a bus read x we can say yes the work is done that is we somehow assume that there is a commitment from all the processors to invalidate so there is uh, this concept of right being committed it has not complete but it has committed to happen okay so we are uh, assuming a commit instead of a complete so write completeness is replaced by write commitment because as soon as I send a bus transaction the invalidations will eventually take place but they will definitely take place before the next transactions happens okay and we are not bothered about uh, the in the remote processor where is that invalidation put in its local order because these will be local hits right 
So the local hits and misses don't appear on the bus. So I'm not concerned about the local order. I'm only concerned on the bus order and uh, I'm sure that this invalidation will have definitely finished before the next bus transaction. Okay. So the protocol guarantees that it will first finish the task only then the new transaction can take place. So this way a commitment of invalidation implies a completeness of the right. Okay. So that was right completeness. Next condition is right atomicity which says that once you have uh, written a value everybody sees the same value across all the processors. Okay, so a read returns a value of a particular write means that the write transaction is gone onto the bus and everybody has seen it. Okay, so we have seen that with respect to if I prove serialization plus completeness, okay, these two things are kind of implying my write atomicity requirement. So write atomicity is also guaranteed. Okay, now one small side note about write backs. What about write backs? But we say that write backs can happen anytime because there are no sharers for such blocks. They can go anytime onto the bus. Then nobody is interested in seeing them because there are no sharers. So nobody sees them. Memory gets updated. Now the question is uh, what about reads to such things? So I had a write back going onto the bus, write backs for x. And if there is a read x coming, now what happens to this new read x? Now this new read x will go onto the bus and definitely this time the memory will provide the data for this and because the write back has updated the memory. Okay, So the write backs which go onto the bus although we are not interested in their serialization but we uh, can definitely say that the future reads will get the most recently written value from the memory. Okay. The next requirement is deadlock. Uh, we are not talking of the deadlock like uh, which happened in the case of uh, buffers where two controllers are waiting for each other's buffers or the traffic light junction. But in protocol, we are discussing about a protocol level fetch deadlock. Okay, So this is a special kind of deadlock where I have a controller, suppose this, which is saying I want to send something onto the bus. Okay, So it has sent a bus request and it says until I get a grant I will not do anything. I will just keep waiting here for me to get the bus. In the meanwhile, some request comes onto the bus to the same controller. It says I want some help from you. So, But the, this one says until you give me the bus I won't do anything. So you can see this results into a deadlock because the blue one says I want the bus and the orange one is not ready to respond. So nobody is releasing the bus and hence they both keep waiting. So this is called a protocol level fetch deadlock. Okay. Why is this happening? Because I want to issue a request but I am not willing to respond to the incoming request. Right? So if there is an incoming request, I ignore it whereas my outgoing request I am only interested in sending my request outside. So this creates a problem. I want to issue it but I am not servicing but to come out of this we need to start servicing the incoming request. So even if the blue one is pending I should be catering to the request coming onto the bus. Okay? So cache controller is waiting for the bus grant but at the same time it must snoop that is snooping should happen in parallel and if you snoop you may also want to give data if you have the block okay so your uh, the request which you want to send outside they may be pending but you should be ready to send responses to the outside world at the same time right so you should be able to cater to this otherwise there will be a protocol level deadlock okay Take example so here P1 sends a read exclusive for A. It has in S it wants to go to M state. Okay? And P2 says I want to go to M state for block B. So both of them want different blocks. Okay? And it so happens that uh, P2 gets the grant and it sends a request for B. And if you see B is in state M with P1. So P1 has to give the data to P2 but P1 says I want uh, access for A until you give that I will not move ahead. So this will create a deadlock. So what should happen is once P1 sees that a uh, read X on B is pending, it should ignore or it, it can keep this pending. It need not keep waiting here but cater to this request. Okay? It should flush the block B onto the bus so that P2 can finish its work and eventually 
P1 will get a chance to go on to the bus. Okay, this is how while we, our requests are pending, we should be ready to keep servicing requests coming onto the bus. We will avoid the deadlock. Live lock happens uh, when multiple processors want to change the same block. Everybody wants to change the same block. They will want go onto the bus. One of them will get the access. They will move from I to M. Okay, so the block move from I to M. But while the processor was about to write, that is the processor and the cache will now try to write to this block. But in the meanwhile, another processor comes and says, I want this block back. Okay, so the block moved here. And before it went to the processor, before it could go there, the block was taken away by this again. Okay, So, we kind of have a ping pong effect of the ball or the block moving from one processor to the other. Okay, So, if there is a simultaneous access, this processor has to release it and then again there will be a cache miss. So, we have a cache miss, we go onto the bus, we get the block. Before I change the block, somebody else takes away the block from me. Okay, So, lot of activity but no forward progress and that is what live lock means. So, how do you solve this? So, to solve this we need to, this is the solution, you have to design the cache and processor interaction properly, this portion. You have to say that once I get the block, until we finish the write, I am not going to service requests on that particular block. So, if this is implemented in the uh, processor FSM, sorry, the coherence FSM, then live lock can be avoided. So, live lock is avoided by implementing a proper uh, processor and cache handshake. Last requirement, starvation. Now, starvation happens when multiple processors are competing for the bus. Right? Everybody wants to go onto the bus, only few of them get and it is possible that only selected few get the bus grant and certain others are starved. So, for a fair uh, solution that is to avoid starvation, I need an arbiter which is fair or I can use a FIFO where the services are queued up or first come first serve type of implementation policies. So, to solve starvation, we can have fair arbitration, FIFO queues and FCFS uh, scheduling. Okay. Now, for FIFO, you will need buffers. So, this might be expensive. So, uh, certain implementations say, I will have no buffers because starvation does not happen very often, but I will have counters. So, whenever you do not accept a request from a processor, we can keep a counter with that uh, processor saying that I have refused this processor n number of times and then check for a threshold. So, once you have refused a particular processor say n times, then after that you can give a priority to this processor. Okay? So, this way we can uh, avoid starvation. Right? So, uh, with these uh, all discussions, we have established that right serialization, completeness, atomicity, deadlock, live lock, starvation are possible and correctly implemented in our discussed design. Okay? So, with this, we have completed the single level cache with atomic bus. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.